Good morning, brothers and sisters. I hope you are well wherever you are. And I trust that uh, whether it's Sunday, whether it's during the week, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, we are able to remember God, to praise Him, and to worship Him wherever we are. Welcome to today's worship service. Myself, Pastor T. Rabari. Welcome, Reform Church Joburg, Reform Church Joburg West, Reform Church Ekuleni South. Welcome to all believers and church members of other congregations who might be able to watch and listen to this worship service offering. Beloved, let us then get into the worship by seeking help, by having time of silence, and we seek God's help to can worship Him. <clears throat> our eyes are lifted upward, and we ask ourselves, where will our help come from? Our help, our salvation, our deliverance comes from Jehovah, the Lord God who created heaven, earth, and all that exists. Beloved, may the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God our Father be with you in this worship service through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved, let us come to sing the song from Amagama Oku Sabelela, number 95, the song that says, Mangienze Indumiso, let us make praise to the Lord of salvation. Ingenzele in Tabiso. He made a payment for me. He is my uh, redeemer. Umfeli wami. Ingenzele in Tabiso. He paid for me. And also, verse 2 I was in sin. I was in wrong. But then uh, he took me out of death. And verse 3 he gave me to listen to his word and to become his person because of his grace. And then verse 4, he took me out of misery and gave me life. Now I look forward or focus on heaven or eternal life. So let's sing that song. Uh, I think it's using the tune which many know from Venda Vaziautali Boda, Mangienze Indumiso. Sing, I is 
sawa kumfendi wami. Beloved, let us then uh, come together in faith and say together what we believe in as summarized in the Apostles' Creed. Today we'll use the Apostles' Creed in Sisutu. Let us say from hearts that believe and say together, Kidumela mdimund atea matla oche, mupi wali hodimo li wali fati, li Jesu Kreste murua wana anuti ili ngurena waruna, ya emutu inkimoya ohalalela. Ya tui tui ki mureta na Maria. Ya utu si tui ng bushoko misheng ya ponse pilato. Ya taki si tui ng sfapanong. Ashwa apadwa libiti ng. Atewe la ngalong ya bafu. Atuha bafu nga li tazela buraro. Anyulu hela li hodimu. Ayadula li tuho ngle li tuna la mdimu o matla ose. Mi uta kutlat ing. Uta asula ba pilang li ba shule. Kidume la moya o halale lang. Kidumela li kereke e halale lang. Eka li fatsi ngloshi. Li kopano yaba halalidi. Li tsuarelo ya dibi. Li tsuho ya mmele. Li bupilo bosa fili. Amen. Beloved, let us continue uh, worshiping God in also coming to the reading of God's law. We read and remind each other the Ten Commandments given to God's people, God's redeemed uh, God's church um, because he redeemed us to be his people, to walk with him to trust him, to love him to obey him and he redeemed us showing us that he is the one who through his grace involves us includes us in his covenant and continues with us, giving us the strength so let us read and remind each other the ten commandments from Exodus 20 verse 1 to 17 It's not just a way of reminder but let us also be having heart and attitude of looking at ourselves, humbling ourselves and reflecting, using God's word on how we are and being led by these commandments to seek God's forgiveness to confess our sins and to also repent Exodus 20 from verse 1 to 17 it says and God spoke all these words saying I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery you shall have no other gods before me you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbors. Amen. Beloved, as we uh, did in the past Sundays, we continue to reflect on the Ten Commandments and we take each commandment today. Let us look at the Eighth Commandment and uh, together with the recording or the 
audio recording or video recording there is a pamphlet and on the pamphlet there is the Heidelberg Catechism uh, Lord's Day 42 regarding Commandment 8 in Venda and in Zulu but here I will lead you in reflecting on the 8th commandment using uh, the Heidelberg Catechism in English so in Lord's Day 42 regarding the 8th commandment question 110 we find the question, what does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? And we believe that God forbids not only such theft and robbery as are punished by the magistrate, but God also brands all as theft, all wicked tricks and devices, whereby we aim to appropriate our neighbor's goods, whether by force or with show of right as unjust weights, else measures and wears false coins ashari or any other means forbidden by god likewise all covetousness and all abuse and waste of his gifts lord's day 42 continues with the second question 111 but what does god require of you in this commandment and the answer we believe is that i further my neighbor's profit wherever I can or may. Deal with him as I would have others deal with me. And labor faithfully that I may be able to relieve the needy. Indeed, the church should say we believe. Beloved, as I said, uh, in together with uh, whether you get the audio or the video recording, uh, you should have the pamphlet and you can also read in Venda and Zulu. Let us reflect on the reading of the law, being assured of God's pardon, by also singing the song in English, Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Let us in continue continuing to worship God. Uh, come to prayer. I will lead you in prayer. Let us uh, pray. Oh Jehovah, our God and Father, our Father in Jesus Christ, 
you created us, you give us life, you give us to breathe, you give us opportunity to be on your earth, you also provide and care for us. You, Jehovah, are almighty, you are the most high God. You know everything and see everything. And indeed, everything is under your control. We pray, O oh God, on this day, thanking you for this day. Thanking you for the time, the opportunity to remember you as our creator, as our redeemer, as our savior. We thank you also looking at the past days and nights. We thank you for protection, for food, for clothing, for shelter. In all that we're able to do, we thank you for the strength, the wisdom to can achieve and to succeed. In all the situations of difficulty and affliction, we continue to look to you, calling to you as our Savior. There is no other God besides you, except you, Jehovah. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us, that indeed you are Savior, that indeed above you there is no other. O Jehovah, we ask that indeed you forgive our sins. Help us to change when we realize that we've done wrong. We thank you for your commandments that remind you of the standard of life, the way we must live. We look at your commandments. We look at ourselves. We can see that we have failed. We have transgressed your commandments. We ask, O oh God, that have mercy on us. Help us to change, help us to repent. Help us, O oh God, to show love. Love towards you, but also love to our neighbors. We pray, O oh God, that you help us in every situation. We are in this world where there is difficulty, there is suffering. Help us against temptations. Help us in every situation to choose what is right and forsake what is wrong. We need you, O oh God. Lead us direct us through your Holy Spirit and your word. We pray, O oh God, thanking you, but also knowing that as people we are in this world, our bodies are weak, we get sick, we get tired, we get old, eventually we even die. We pray, O oh God, that you strengthen our bodies. We ask for healing. We ask for life, O oh God, in our bodies. We ask for strength so that indeed we continue living. And in whatever condition of health, we are able, O oh God, to even continue trusting in you. We pray knowing that even in these times we are under pressure because of COVID-19 pandemic. O oh God, we ask that you help us. Help us in this situation. Help the doctors, nurses, medical personnel, researchers, even not just taking care of the sick, but also in finding cures. Help us. Help our government, help our leaders, help us also to take seriously the advices that we are given. We pray also for those who, oh Lord, you call them, not just through COVID-19, but as life we know that here on earth is not our eternal home. And we pray that you comfort those who are grieving. We also remember the Neforobode family who lost a family member, oh God, be with them. Continue to comfort them. Continue to comfort all of us, knowing that death, indeed, it happens. But death is not the end. And we must look forward to the eternal life and the resurrection of the body. We pray to you, oh God, that help us even as we are faced with economic hardship in South Africa. Not just looking at the economy of our country, but even as individuals, families. Help us, O oh God, so that we can be able to live. Help us to also help others and help each other. Help us with wisdom. Help us with resources. Help us even in our country that our economy can be arranged in such a way that all the citizens of this country can benefit from the resources of this country. Help us, O oh God, we cry also about security, there is crime, there is violence. Oh God, protect us. We ask from you, oh God, that you help even our justice system, that it be strong and bold in fighting against wrong. 
but help us also as citizens of South Africa to can have love and tolerate each other and respect others. We ask from you, O oh God, that you help not only ourselves here in South Africa, but also other governments all over the earth. Help them in their duties and responsibilities of governing. Help also in places where there is need of peace, because we hear of wars sometimes and conflicts. Sometimes even it affects your church. There is persecution affecting your children. We pray, O oh God, that you intervene, that there be peace. We pray, O oh God, that governments can work together and also support where there is need, whether there is disasters, whether there is oppression, and also in protecting this environment, this earth that you have given us. We pray, O oh God, that please be with us, O oh Jehovah, in our everyday lives. Some we go to work, some we are in need of jobs, some we are entrepreneurs and doing business. Help us in the endeavors that we are called to, to do. Help us even in our schools. Some are learners, some are in universities, some are secondary school. Oh God, even the metrics. Help them, especially in this difficult year where there is closing and opening of schools and sometimes we don't know how the calendar will go. But, oh God, help us in our studies so that we get focused and committed. We ask, oh God, even as church, that you help us, not just through these means that we are using, but also to grow, even in saving you in whatever situation, with whatever you have given us. Help us, oh Jehovah. We ask you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, let us continue uh, in worship and come to the reading of today's word and today's scripture. As we know, we are continuing in the book or the letter of Second Corinthians. And in Second Corinthians today, we are continuing in chapter 7. We will start from verse 2 and read until the end of that uh, chapter, which is verse 16. I am reading using the English Standard Version. You will follow in the Bible versions that you have. And it reads as follows. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you. For I said before that you are in our hearts. To die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fighting within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what earnestness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourself innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoiced still more at the joy of Titus, 
because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proven true. And his affection for you is even greater, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have perfect confidence in you. Amen. Beloved, having read this passage of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7 from verse 2 to 4, I want us to focus on verse 2 to 4 as the passage or the verses through which we can understand the main lesson or get the theme which connects the the verses that we read. Verse 2, it says, Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of, of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort in all our affliction. I am overflowing with joy. So, as you know, we are continuing in this passage, in this letter, and the main thing of looking at this letter is that we must focus on what God has given us, what God has done for us in order that we fulfill um, the work or mission regardless of circumstances. Now, in looking at this chapter that we read today, uh, the theme is that what is in our hearts, what is in your heart. When you think of other believers or other church members, what comes to mind, what attitude do you have, what feeling do you have when you think of church members, when you think of other believers? Beloved, indeed it is an important question because what is in my heart, what is in your heart, will determine your attitude, will determine your actions toward other church members. And as I said in the passage that we read, especially when you look at verse 3, Paul says when he talks of the believers or church in Corinth, you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with bold, great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort in all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. When you listen to these words, then you sometimes then understand why other people want church services to resume, to open, church to gather, even during COVID-19 pandemic. Because when you ask, when you listen to others, it's because in their heart, they love other church members. And they want to meet, they want to gather. Even when you were to ask church members, for example, in classes how they about going to the combined services which we used to have in Soweto, Piri Hall, or you ask them about synod conferences uh, like youth, like women, you will find one of the big reasons is that I'm going there because I want to meet others. Or I miss those gatherings because I miss other people or meeting other friends and other believers. And it is a very big reason. I don't know for you. What is it when you think of church gathering? What is it that happens in your heart, that happens in your mind? I know some, yes, will say the most important thing is preaching, which is good. It's true. Hearing the word, the word of God. Some will even say food. Because in those conferences and combined services, there was food. But the fellowship, the meeting, coming together of other believers is important as well. It's important because God uses church family. God uses the worshipping of believers, the meeting of church members, being connected as body of Christ, he uses that to bless you and to advance you. 
And yes, at the same time, it is painful when there is conflict in the church family, when there is tension in our relationships as church members. You will remember, beloved, as we mentioned in the past sections, looking at this letter, that this letter was written to address the tension that was there between Paul and the church or church members of Corinth. And in this part that we read, chapter 7, verse 2 to 16, it is giving a reason why Paul actually wrote this letter of 2 Corinthians. And as I said, even when we look at the last section, chapter 6, verse 11, to chapter 7, verse 1, this is actually a conclusion of the first part of the letter or the section of the letter that began in chapter 1, verse 12 where Paul was actually explaining why he changed his travel plans of coming twice to Corinth. And he explained his work as an apostle, that he's working for the new covenant, bringing people into the new covenant of God. God is using him. Through him, people get the new covenant, which is faith in Jesus Christ, salvation through faith in Jesus alone. Now, maybe let us remind each other a bit of the background, as I, I did also in chapter 1. I am working with the understanding that this letter was written during the third missionary journey of Paul, which you read about in Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to chapter 21. But during the second missionary journey, which you read about in Acts 15, verse 36, until Acts chapter 17, verse 23, you find that Paul uh, lived and preached in the city of Corinth for 18 months. And the things that happened in Corinth, you read about them in Acts chapter 18, verse 1 to 17. So Paul went from Antioch on the second missionary journey. He passed through the churches of Galatia or Asia. And then he came to Ephesus, where he lived and preached for more than two years. But before he came to Ephesus, or just in the beginning of his work and stay in Ephesus, Paul wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians that we have in the Bible. But then there was also another visit, which Paul made to Corinth, because Ephesus and Corinth was divided by, by the sea. So you could go from Ephesus over the sea to Corinth. So Paul probably visited the second time. It, although it is not recorded in the Bible. But you get a sense of it when you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, and 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, where he says, this is the third time that I am coming to you. The first time, obviously, is probably Acts 18, when he worked there. But then, when did the second time happen? Probably in between, when he was in Ephesus. And the third time is when he is coming, after sending this letter of 2 Corinthians. So it was during that second visit, where Paul was challenged by some people, who had mobilized the church to reject the message that Paul had preached. You must not believe what Paul preached. You must not accept Paul as an apostle. And you must not support the collection of money which Paul had encouraged the churches to do uh, for the saints or for the churches in the province of Judea. So Paul dealt with the issue when he came on that visit and he promised to come back again that before going to Macedonia, he will first go to Corinth and then from Macedonia, he will come back again through Corinth. So that's what we saw in chapter 1 verse 16. However, instead of going to Corinth from Ephesus, Paul then sent a letter which we hear about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And probably he sent that letter with Titus. Uh, that's what we read in chapter 7 verse 8 and 9. And Paul gave a reason for not coming to visit because he was giving the church the believers, church members, time to fix the issues so that when he comes, 
it is not another painful visit where uh, he has to talk about the wrong things they are doing. We can go back to chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, where he says, I didn't want to come because I'm giving you chance, time to fix the issues. However, even though Paul was giving them time, he wrote a letter. He was anxious. Number one, he was anxious about the condition of the church. But secondly, he was anxious or concerned. How did the church members receive that letter? How did they respond? And that's what was in his heart. And that's why even when he went from Ephesus, instead of going to Corinth over the sea, he went inland, going north. And as we read in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, he came to the city of Troas. And even though there was opportunity to preach the gospel in his heart, in his spirit, he was not at rest because he was concerned, Titus, we should have been meeting here. But then Titus didn't arrive. So what did Paul do? He didn't stay very long in Troas. He went over the sea into Macedonia. Macedonia is those churches, Bophilippi, Thessalonica, Berea. He went to those areas. And that's where he then met, or Titus came. He intercepted Titus. And then got the report from Titus that the visit went well. The majority of the church have repented. They love you. They accept you. And actually they've started to deal or they've dealt with those people who were doing sin, whether those who caused division or some who were rejecting Paul, doing sexual immorality, but rejecting even the rebuke of Paul. So that was a good report, that the people have repented. And that is then what Titus then said, but there are still issues. There are still some who have questions. There are still some who are raising issues. And that's what made Paul to write this letter of 2 Corinthians. He was writing it when he was in Macedonia. And he sent it ahead with Titus and Timothy and others. You can read that also in chapter 8, verse 17. Encouraging the church of Corinth that, look, I'm coming. But I'm sending you these brothers who will encourage you, finish the collection. So that when I come, you have already done the collection for the poor believers or suffering believers in Judea. So, beloved, you should see this letter. It's not necessarily about conflict. But it's actually a love letter when you read it. Because there are many instances where Paul is talking about how he feels about the church in Corinth. The church members in Corinth. And it's either you go to chapter 2 verse 4. He talks about what is in his heart. Last time we read in chapter 6 verse 11 to 13. You are in our hearts. Our hearts are open. We are not restricted towards you. And even here in chapter 7 verse 2 to 4. Make room in your hearts. We love you. We have opened our hearts for you. You also church members. Open your hearts for us. Church of Corinth. Accept us. Love us. So, this is actually a love letter. Loving the church. Loving other believers or church members. And when there is a disagreement or tension, sometimes our attitude or response is that, I, whatever, I don't care. I don't care anymore about the church. I'm no longer going to attend. I'm no longer going to meetings. I'm no longer going to give money. I'm no longer going to meet with other believers. Sometimes when there is problems and conflict, that is the attitude, whatever. I don't care. But we are encouraged even through this letter and this passage to have the right heart and attitude towards other believers. And even when we think of church, even when there is conflict, tension in the relationships, we should learn from even the efforts, the actions that Paul did writing to this, to, to this church many times or sending people like Titus to go and visit. He's not giving up the connection he has with the church of Corinth. And that is what, as church leaders, we must learn to have a loving heart, a right attitude toward church members that we are leading. But it is also this 
passage reflecting or showing what is in God's heart, we must represent the love and commitment of Christ to the church. Not just the group, but also to the church individually, the individual church members. And that is why I ask, what is in your heart? What is in your heart when you think of other church members? When you think of other believers? When you think of church? When you think of church, what comes to your mind? How does your heart feel? Or how should it feel? And let us learn from this passage. Firstly, how do we understand and explain our church family or church connection or church relations? How do we see church or the fellowship of believers, the community of Christians, the church family? How do we see it? Paul continues to make clear here, brothers and sisters, to the believers and church of Corinth, how he sees them and how important they are to him. And it is important, as it is widely advised, that in relationships, whether it's husband and wife, whether it's parents and children, whether it's friend and friend, or even work relationship, you must make it clear with words and actions, sometimes repeating how you love others, the people you live with, the people you are in relationship with, how important they are. It is important to say it. And we can learn from this the way Paul is talking or even what Paul is saying, especially verse 2 to verse 4, how we can also explain church family or church relationship. And there are three things. Number one, when you look at verse 2, church is people you love and you do good to them or for them. As we read in chapter 6, verse 11 to 13. It was clear. Paul is saying, now I have no problem with you. I love you. The problem is in your hearts, the church of Corinth. But now, because we love you, you must also love us. And that's why he says, make room for us. Make room in your hearts for us. That is Paul, Silas, and Timothy, the ones who preached in Corinth. And we learn here actually a good strategy for fixing relationship or restoring relationship where you open yourself first. You open yourself to the other person expressing love before you expect them to love you or to open up to you. Because sometimes people for them to open up to you, you must open up yourself to them. But you find we want others to open themselves up to us and then we blame each other. Hey, there's no love. There's no unity. It's about opening ourselves up. And that's what Paul here is doing. He further makes clear that he wronged no one. He corrupted no one. He took advantage of no one. And he's probably saying this, brothers and sisters, because maybe there were some accusations regarding his work, regarding why he is working as an apostle, going through the churches, also coming to Corinth with a letter, the first Corinthians, uh, you can read chapter 16, when he was coming from Galatia. He says, as I have encouraged the churches in Galatia, you must also make the collection. So probably some will be saying, Paul is not honest. Paul is a fraud. Paul is collecting this money and he will chow the money or he will uh, mishandle the money, he will mismanage the money, he's doing it for himself but not just the money issue but even being an apostle but Paul has made clear that we are honest before God we don't change the gospel message just to please people or to get money from people just to fill up the church so that people can love us and give us money he has made that clear and even when he was Corinth, by the way, he didn't get financial support from the church of Corinth. He got financial support from other churches. And also he supported himself by doing tents or making tents. But all that, it was out of love. He preached Christ to them. But even when there are problems, he write to them. He pray for them. He sent people like Titus to go and visit and encourage 
so that they repent. Even though the people, maybe they were doing bad things, saying bad things about you, but he still loves them. And when you don't love people, you can steal from them. You give them substandard service. You don't give them 100%. You give them poor service, poor product. You don't care. You don't love. When you don't care, then no matter what happens to them. But that's what Paul is saying. I love you. There is love in my heart. When I look at you, I love you. And that love in the heart is what then leads, not just Paul, but must also lead us in what we say and what we do toward other church members or regarding other church members. Because if we love, if indeed we understand that this church or as a church, we are a family, we must love each other, then we will give time, we will give energy, we will give money, we will give ourselves and we do good so that others advance and grow. But the other thing when you look at church, church is people you have commitment to. It is not just a loose association, you know, something which you can just come in and get out. We must be serious when you talk of church membership. It's a commitment. Paul is not shy to declare that the believers and church of Corinth are in his heart. They are in our hearts. And he says to die together and to live together. This reminds me of uh, this movie uh, called Bad Boys for Life starring uh, Martin Lawrence and Will Smith. Although, yes, it's not a, a good movie according to Bible standards, but the movie is about two detectives, police detectives who fight to bring down the drug criminals in their city. So they put themselves in dangerous and risky situations and sometimes uh, they do strange things. But one thing that that movie you will know it about is that those two police, they've got each other's back. They support each other. And they say, we ride together and we die together. Bad boys for life. Now, when you talk of church, we should be saying good boys for life. Where we live together and we die together. We die together, we live together. Good boys for life. We should rather make a movie called that. Good boys for life. Because we should be able to say that. You are in our hearts. We die together. We live together. We should say that to each other. Out of commitment. Because that's what even in that movie, they are committed that no matter what happens, no matter the situation, even if we are faced with death, we are fighting together. We are fighting those criminals. That's commitment. Can you say that when you talk of church? We should be able to say that because God is in us. God is committed to his church. Not just the group of believers, but even you individually. He is committed to you. He loves you. That's why he gave you Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus died for you. You can't talk of God's love. And then you don't love the people that God loves. You can't talk of being committed to God. But then you are not talking of commitment to the things or to the people that God is committed to. The people that Jesus died for. Church is family. Because we have the same father. The same blood of Jesus. The same spirit. The same faith. We are called to live for God. And to serve Jesus. But how do we do that? By what we do together as church. And what we do for the church or church members. And remember also that, by the way, we are going to the same heaven. There is no two heavens. Ne? We are going to the same heaven, one heaven of God, one eternal life. And this is very important to remember. Because sometimes we disagree and we look at other church members and we think uh, they are not our together with us. But when you sit down and understand that how, you are saying you are going to eternal life. Because Jesus died for you. You believe in Jesus. He saved you. Now, this other one, where is he going, Kant? 
Because you are going to spend eternal life together. So that's why we say we die together, we live together. And when we understand this, then we will take seriously commitment. Commitment to the church. Commitment to each other. Commitment to participate as family of God. But the other thing when we look at the church. Verse 4. Church is people you are hopeful about. Hopeful. Don't be negative or despondent. But you, when you listen to verse 4, Paul is very hopeful about the church. Even though there was tension. Even though there was problems. Paul talks of acting with great boldness and great pride toward the believers and the church of Corinth. It is like a parent who is confident and loves his children. He not only, the parent doesn't only want the best for the children, but he also hopes that the children will be good or they will achieve something in the future. It is difficult, yes, to have hope for good regarding people who have done bad things to you. Or maybe you have failed in relationship. Now you don't have hope about relationships. It is difficult to have hope for good. When you look at the church, sometimes you see disagreements and failures. But where does Paul get the confidence, the boldness regarding the people of Corinth? Where does he get the pride regarding the believers, church members of Corinth? It comes from knowing God who loved the church, God who continues to work in the lives of believers, to bring them to repentance and to grow the believers in holiness. And in the end, they will be perfect in eternal life. That work of God is what should also give us hope when we look at ourselves individually, but also when we look at ourselves Look at the church and look at other church members. And that is why even chapter 1, verse 1, how does he talk of the church? The saints, the holy ones of God, the chosen ones of God. He refers to them as saints, even though there is problems in the church. Even in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 to 14, he talked of God's grace in his life, but also having confident that on the last day, he will boast about the believers of Corinth. And they will boast about him. He's looking with eternal life. He's having the eternal perspective. He looks to God. What is God doing? God is working in his church. Let's have hope about each other, about the church. And that is what then eternal life makes us to, to, to look at things better. You know, as we, 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 we talked about in chapter 4, let's look at the unseen, the eternal. It then helps you to understand this life, which is temporary. And then you are comforted. You are strengthened. You are able to persevere, knowing that you are going to the eternal life. But then also, eternal life should also give you hope when you look at the church and your fellow church members. And should help you to have confidence and hope. Paul, as he's saying in verse 4, he is filled with comfort, overflowing with joy, even when he hears the report of evidence of the power of the grace of God in the lives of the believers and in the church of Corinth. It is what he was praying for. It is what he was working for. It is what was in his heart. God, this is what I'm hoping for. Your people to repent, to have love. And indeed, when it happens, he is overflowed with joy. What do you hope for? For yourself and for others. And when it happens, then it gives you comfort and joy. However, if we don't hope for the grace of God and eternal life, working in the church, then it's no wonder we will, not, we, will act, we will not act in the right way. We don't get comfort. We don't get joy when God works in the lives of other believers. But let me come to the second thing. When we look at this passage, 
talking about what is in your heart when you think of other believers. Not only how should you explain your relationship with other believers. But the second thing, looking at verse 5 to 9. We must understand how God gives comfort and joy using the church. It is important that you take serious church relation, church fellowship, connection with other believers. Also because you know the blessings that God works to you and through you to others. Paul makes clear how God comforted him and his fellow workers like Silas and Timothy probably. And it helps us to realize how God works and why it's important. Not just church is important to God, but also important in our lives, giving us comfort and joy. And there are two things. When you look at verse 5 to 6, God comforts the downcast through the coming of other believers. When Paul came into Macedonia, he is making clear that, hey, it was difficult. Even in chapter 1, verse 8, he talked about difficulty in Asia, probably Ephesus or the churches in Galatia or that region. But now he's talking about what happened when he was in Macedonia or when he is in Macedonia. That when we came in, hey, we didn't rest. There was a lot of work. There was a lot of difficulty. There was suffering. There was opposition from the Jews, from the Greeks. But even in us, we were uh, not resting. We were concerned about the church. It was heavy. Paul was saying, look, when I think of you, I was concerned. Sometimes when I look at the situation, he's even confessing, God comforts the downcast. Downcast means it's like a person looking down. You are tired. You can't look up. You can't look forward. You are tired. You think Sometimes you think of giving up. But Paul says, God who comforts the downcast. He comforted us. And this is, you remember chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. God of all comfort. He comforts in all afflictions, in all times and situations that can cause us distress, that can cause us discomfort. We should trust in God who comforts and gives strength so that indeed we can look upward, we can look forward. And in this case, Paul was comforted even when the situation was difficult in Macedonia by the coming of Titus. It was another way of God, another way which God uses, God works to bring comfort. And Paul is saying this, God comforted us through the coming of Titus. And it is a reminder, a confirmation that indeed the coming of other believers is another way which God can comfort. Sometimes we might bring pain to others. And that's why we must repent. But family, church family, should be a source of comfort. And that's why even when you read uh, further uh, in chapter 7, you hear it talking in verse 14 about Titus also being refreshed by the believers in Corinth. Probably when Titus was going there, he was afraid. Uh, how, how, how will these people who hate Paul, how will they accept me? But he was refreshed. He was refreshed, given rest, peace, strength by the believers in Corinth. That is what church should be. That is how God works. And we refresh each other. We comfort each other. We bring the comfort of God to others, whether through prayer, whether through visiting each other, talking to each other, encouraging each other, exhorting each other, advising each other. That's what we need. But the other thing, when you look at verse 7 to 9, why church is important, how God works through the church, the spiritual condition of other believers gives joy and comfort. That's what you see from verse 7 to 9. God did not just give Paul and his fellow workers comfort and joy because Titus now come to them, but also because of the report that of what is happening in the church of Corinth. Titus was now telling Paul, the believers want to see you. They love you. 
They are committed to you. And as Paul says, it made him to have joy. As he's saying in verse 7. Paul was concerned from his second visit where he made a, a, a painful visit. And then he was concerned about the condition of the church. But also, he wrote the letter with pain and anguish. And he sent this letter, which we don't have in the Bible, with Titus, this painful letter, which made the church to grieve, to be sorrowful. And it is, as I said, clear in chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, that he wrote that letter with anguish. And even when he was in Troas, even though he could have preached a long time, he cut short the stay. Because in his heart, he wanted to hear what, is, what happened. Titus, where is Titus? So that he tell us what happened in Corinth. And now the letter has come to Corinth. Titus now comes back. And he tells Paul and others, the believers in Corinth, they responded well to that letter. And Paul admits, even now, in verse 8 and 9, that, yeah, when I wrote that letter, I realized, I sometimes regretted it, that why did I write it this way? Maybe I shouldn't have written it, but no, I wrote it. He was concerned about how it was going to be received. It made the people to grieve. It made the people to, to have sorrow. In other words, it might be the words he used. But sometimes when you talk to people about their sin, calling them to repent, to change, it causes sorrow. It's not good when people call you to order, when people rebuke you. It's not good. You don't feel happy. To be rebuked, to be disciplined, to be sometimes shouted at for doing wrong. Yeah, it's painful. And probably Paul in that letter, he was using strong language. I'm not talking bad language. Strong, direct language of the wrong that they were doing, the need for them to repent. And Paul get the report from Titus that yes, the believers were grieved, they were sorrowful, but for a short time. And now Paul rejoices, not because he made the people to cry or to be sorrowful, but he is filled with joy because they repented. And that's where we must then ask, ask each other, what makes you to, to cry? What makes you to rejoice? What gives you sorrow and makes you to grieve? Obviously, people will talk about, okay, loss of job, loss of loved one, death of loved one, uh, sickness. But we must listen here. What gives us joy and comfort? What gives us grief and sorrow? It should be what also makes God to cry? What must make us cry is what makes God to cry. What makes us to rejoice is what should be also a thing that makes God to rejoice. And what is it that makes God to cry as well? It is sin. When people transgress the law of God, they don't obey God. And that is what should also make us to cry, to grieve when we look around us in the world, when we look even in the church, when we look at our friends, when we look at our colleagues, when we look at our fellow students. And you see in their lives, in my life, in other people's life, people are disobeying God, transgressing the commandments of God. We should be crying. We should be feeling sadness in our hearts. Because sin is a disrespect to God. Disrespect to God's honor. It is a failure to respond to the grace of God. God is offering salvation. He says, I love you. But then you waste his salvation. Imagine you are given a gift. Here is a, a, a gift that somebody paid a lot of money for. And then you throw it away. How will that person feel? How will you feel if somebody does that to you? Imagine God who created this earth. Created you. Gave you life. Now you use your life for other things which are against God. You use your time, your money against God. 
You disrespect God. Jesus has died for you. He has shown grace and love, sacrificed his life. But then what do we do? We want to take our lives and fight against Jesus, not support his word and his name. How do you think it, it, it feels if it was you, people doing that to you? And that is what should make us to cry and have sorrow. And we should be encouraged to then repent when we realize, number one, my sins, our sins, what they mean to God. We should cry about it. And then also encourage others, pray for others, teach others or rebuke others so that they repent. You remember also Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He is in you. God is in you. He is staying with you. Don't grieve him by doing sin. But then what gives you joy and comfort? It should be also what gives God joy and comfort. And what makes God happy? Repentance. When a sinner repents, oh, hey, there is celebration. You know when a team has scored, your favorite team or, or your favorite person has won the competition. How do you celebrate? Ah, you celebrate. You are full of joy. Because that's what you wanted. What does God want? He wants people to repent. What do you want? What do we want as church? We must also want people to repent. Listen to, uh, go and read Luke chapter 15, verse 7 and 10. In verse 7 and 10 it says, There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Do you hear that? In heaven, they are rejoicing. Listen also in Luke 15 verse 10. There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It's a big celebration in heaven when a person repents. Heaven and eternal life, we will be rejoicing because, yes, of God's grace. Because Jesus achieved salvation for us. But also in eternal life. We will be rejoicing with God. And with each other. We will be rejoicing. That indeed. Not only we believed. But indeed we end up in heaven. Now our meeting with other believers. Our connection as church members. Should not just be about keeping each other company. You know, eating food together, running together, just talking soccer together, talking politics together, talking business together. But if you understand this, our meeting, our connection with other believers and church members should be characterized by this matter where we are comforted, we are getting joy because of the grace of God in the lives of other believers. And when we see other church members that they are not right with God, they are not right according to the word of God, they are bringing wrath on themselves, they are in danger, they are not responding to the grace of God, they are wasting it, we should cry. But not just cry and be grieved, but we must learn from Paul, be motivated by love. Pray for them. Talk to them. Like Paul, he writes letters. He even visit them. Encouraging them to repent and to grow in holiness. That's what God made church to do. But it starts with our heart. Rejoicing with what God rejoices. Crying over what God cries for. Then we will understand what Paul was doing here. But the last thing. Number three. When you look from verse 10. The church is an opportunity for us to show repentance and to grow in that commitment to God. Or what in the Bible that I used, earnestness. That means commitment. That means being convinced about God, being devoted to God. That is what church is for. It's a place or it's a relationship 
it's family, but it's actually an opportunity that through it we can show repentance, we can grow in repentance, we can show commitment to God, but also grow in that commitment to God. It is God's plan that you, me and you, we be part of a church family, participate in the community of believers, in the fellowship of believers. And we must take seriously this connection with other believers. And one of the reasons for that is that you, when you believe and repent, you have a place to then practice out that repentance, to grow in that repentance, to grow in your love and commitment to God, in being earnest, in being devoted to God. And that is why when you look at verse 12, chapter 7, verse 12, Paul is giving the reason why he wrote this letter. Even though it made the believers in Corinth to grieve, to cry, or to be sorrow. In verse 12 he says, So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor the sake of the one who suffered the wrong. But listen to this reason. But in order that your earnestness, your commitment for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Your earnestness be revealed to you. You, the church. You should reveal that earnestness, that commitment in the sight of God. And this then helps us to realize what is it that we should be working for as a church. What is it that we should be achieving or as an outcome of whatever we are doing. Whatever we say as church, our relationship, our connection, our fellowship with other believers. What is the outcome? Is that people repent and people show commitment to God. And again, there are two things here. Verse 10 to 13. Repentance and commitment to God is a product and result of godly sorrow and godly grief. That is what we must, as a church, teach. Repent. The first thing that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 4, the first recorded uh, preaching of Jesus, repent for the kingdom of God is near. That's a very important message. Repent. Repentance. That's the big message of the Bible. Everyone must repent. As we read in, even in the last section, uh, chapter 7 verse 1, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So the work of cleansing and bringing holiness to completion involves repentance. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means change of mind. So repentance is the change of mind, change of heart. Why? Because of the gospel. Because of the Holy Spirit. And this change is evident in behavior, in the way now you live. For you to repent, you must realize that you are wrong. You must hate the wrong or the sin that you did. And be sorrowful about it. And hate it. Repentance is not just saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, forgive me. But repentance is evident in changed behavior. And that is why Paul talks of godly grief, godly sorrow, which leads to salvation. And there is worldly grief, worldly sorrow, which leads to death. So in other words, a person can be sorrowful. And you are sorrowful, you are sad because of what happened. But not because of what you did. Because maybe what you did resulted in a bad thing. That's why you are sorry. But you are not really sorry because of what you did is wrong. That's where we start to see the difference between worldly grief and godly grief. Because you can be sad because you, you, you were found out. You are embarrassed. Now you are ashamed about what you were doing. But you are not really sorry or sorrowful because you didn't follow the commandments of God. You grieved God. That's the first thing about godly grief. You can even hear it. Godly grief. You grieved God. You transgressed God's commandments. And that's where godly grief starts from. 
And that's what the church must teach. Because people can be sorrowful for the wrong reason. But we must cry for our sins, about our sins. Because we hurt God, we angered God, we disrespected God. Sometimes people can even cry tears. In the Old Testament, you find people tearing up their clothes and pouring ashes or dust on themselves. But God is saying, the heart. Inside you find the person is not changed. Later, you find the person how is continuing in the wrong things they said they are sorry about. And that is why even when you talk of criminals going to jail, sometimes jail doesn't solve the problems of crime in our country. Whether we are talking of gender-based violence, we are talking of murder. Because those people, you will take them to jail, they come out. They continue doing what they did. So putting a person in a jail, closing them up, yes, you might be protecting society, but then that person, the criminal, the person who did the wrong, is he changed? That's where then people talk of correction. They talk of rehabilitation. And we must understand even the Heidelberg Catechism. We must understand repentance from the Heidelberg Catechism. Lost Day 33. What is repentance? The dying of the old man, the coming to life of the new man. And both of them, where do they start? What is the dying of the old man? Because I sinned against God. I feel sorrow. I hate my sin. I leave it. What is the rising up of the new man? I love God. Now I love his commands. Now I do them. Do you see where it starts? It starts with God. It starts with God. Because you can talk of repentance and change of behavior. But you are not talking of repentance to God. Repentance because of God. That is what leads to salvation. Because sometimes a person can, let's, say, let's talk of drunkenness. And they live drunkenness. But now, they are not in God. They didn't live it because of God. And that's where the church, in its preaching, in its discipline, in its counseling, we should be teaching people that. What is godly sorrow? What is repentance? Which leads to salvation. Because you might change behavior, and let's say some people start to give money in the church. But they are doing it for the wrong reason. They didn't repent. It's not godly sorrow. And you deceive people thinking that they are good, they are right with God. And that's why it's important as church to preach repentance. But right repentance, motivated by the word of God, motivated by the glory of God, motivated by the grace of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit and his word. And that is what we see here in the report that Titus brought. And now, He's saying the believers and church members of Corinth, the majority of them have repented. Their repentance was even visible to Titus. They were earnest. Now they are committed, which means they are convinced of their wrong. They were committed now to doing things the right way, to doing things differently. And their actions were showing. They were showing that, Paul, we hurt you. But we are no longer like that. And that's why he even says, now you are proving yourself even to be innocent. That's what he says in verse 11. Now they are angry at sin. Now they have passion to do what is right. You know, as the saying, some saying says, the best apology, saying sorry and saying thank you, is changed behavior. The believers in Church of Corinth responded to the visit of Paul, to the letter of Paul, that came with Titus. Paul wrote that letter. Not to fight against the one who was doing wrong. Maybe the person caused division. And he caused the people to reject Paul. Or he was doing sexual immorality. And he didn't want the authority of Paul. Paul didn't write the letter for that reason. To fight against that person. Or as he's talking in third person, for the offended. And who's the offended? It's probably himself, Paul. He's talking in third person. But the main aim of writing that letter, which he, he probably sent with Titus, now Titus is bringing the report. It was 
so that you encourage, be encouraged to show your commitment to God and to this faith, to this gospel, to Jesus Christ. And that is what we should be encouraged to do. To do. When we preach, why do we preach? When we do church service, home visitation, counseling, discipline, what is it that we want to achieve? Is it about attacking the person or at defending myself? No. It is about encouraging people to show earnestness, your commitment to God. Let it be visible. Let it grow. The believers and church members of Corinth are given to us here as one of the examples in the Bible of true repentance. Paul is also given to us here as a good example of a church leader or church member of how to respond to people when they repent. It can happen that people don't repent because of the way we do things, the way we talk, what do we say. And it, the way we do things doesn't show or it shows that our heart, we don't have love. We don't have the aim of that person repenting. And it is evident in the way we do things. It can happen that people can repent, but then we are not comforted and we are not rejoicing in our hearts because we don't com get comforted by what makes God comforted. We should learn from Jesus when he encouraged people to truly repent and he even rebuked the church leaders of his time. When you read in Matthew 12, verse 38 to 42. Now in Matthew 12, verse 41, Jesus says, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Foreigners, non-Jews, they repented. But the Jews, Jesus is saying, you are not repenting. Who was Jonah? Jonah was a prophet who did not want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to preach to the enemies of Israel. Why? Because Jonah knew that if those people repent... God will forgive them and accept them. So what did Jonah do? He ran away. He go on, go on to go to another place. But Jehovah is God of grace. He's God of patience. He bring back Jonah and now Jonah go, back, go to Nineveh. And indeed, Jonah preached, repent. God is angry at your sins. And when the people heard the message, go and read Jonah 3. Let me read with you Jonah 3 uh, verse 8 to 10. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Listen to this. Verse 10, John, Jonah 3. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented. In other words, he reversed the anger and the punishment that he was supposed to bring to them. Relented of the disaster that he has said he will do to them, and he did not do it. The people of Nineveh, the church of Corinth, are given to us as good examples of repentance, and also how to evaluate repentance. As I said, some people can have sorrow, but they don't repent. Some people turn to themselves. They are full of regret, and they end up being depressed like Judas Iscariot, Matthew 27. Yes, he regretted that he betrayed Jesus. But instead of turning to Jesus, he killed himself. Esau, when you read Hebrews 12, verse 15 to 17, he also didn't repent. But later, it was too late. So, we must lead people to turn to Jesus for mercy, for forgiveness, so that they get God's grace and righteousness. But, beloved, when we don't have this aim in our hearts, that people must repent, sinners must repent, what do we do? Then we don't preach the gospel to them. We'll be like Jonah. We don't want people to repent. So, we keep quiet. And we blame people. Hey, people are not repenting. But have we talked to them? Have we evangelized? Have we preached to them? We don't spread the gospel. We don't call people to repentance. Because it's not in our heart. The love for sinners to repent. The joy of sinners repenting. The grief of sinners not repenting. Is it in our hearts? When we don't have it in our hearts, this repentance of sinners, 
then we don't discipline. We don't pray. We don't rebuke. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll gossip. But we don't do the action that leads people to repentance. And when we don't have it in our hearts, the aim that people must repent, sinners must repent. We don't help each other to grow in holiness, but we fail then to even strengthen people to overcome sin. We fail to strengthen people to produce righteousness. But also repentance and commitment to God is evident in obedience to God. That's what you see in chapter 7, the, the second part of verse 13 to, to verse 16. Paul was not just comforted because of the repentance and the commitment of the believers and church of Corinth. Paul was also overjoyed because of the joy that was in Titus. Titus was happy. He was full of joy. Why? Because he came back from Corinth. He now talked good things about Corinth. And Paul is happy because he had talked good things about the church in Corinth. The believers in Corinth. You know, even when there were problems, Paul talked good things about the people of Corinth. Many times when there is problem in relationships, in church, family, friendship, we talk negatively about others who we disagree with or who we are having tension with. We talk bad things about them. But we must learn here. Paul talked good things about the church of Corinth as a way also to encourage Titus to go and visit or even to take the letter. And now Titus come back. He talks of how he was received by the church of Corinth. Not just people receiving him, but their obedience. Because sometimes we can be received well in places, in homes, but the people have not repented. The people don't obey the commands of God. That's the sad thing. We, 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 as a church community, yes, we can enjoy each other's company in conferences, in church services, but we don't enjoy obeying God's commands. Because that's the main thing. Verse 15 talks of the obedience that was evident in the majority of the church members of Corinth. You know, it can happen as a pastor or even as a church elder. You have to visit, you have to visit the church members. You know, uh, you get tea and scones. Yeah, you get cool drinks. You get food. But then you don't talk obedience. You don't talk the people that they must repent and obey. You enjoy the food. Yeah, it happens. You find you no longer call the people to repent, but you enjoy the tea, you enjoy the cool drink. But you no longer call people to obedience to God. Yes, you were received well. But are the people committing to obedience of God's commands? That's what must give us joy and comfort. And that's what must grieve us. We must not be happy about the food we get. We must be happy about obedience. Titus comes back with the report that the believers and church of Corinth, they are showing obedience. They received Titus with fear and trembling. The fear and trembling is not about only the, re the respect of Titus, respect of Paul as servants of God, but also the fear and trembling is the attitude that worshippers of God of Jehovah, those who obey God, they have it We fear and we tremble in response to the glory and the greatness of God. Philippians chapter 2, Philippians 2 verse 12 to 14 says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We are encouraged to fear and respect God, but also remember the pain, the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross for us. He went through the punishment for sin. He took on God's wrath. And we must be encouraged by that. Encourage each other to obey God. Obedience must then become the characteristic of the lives of believers, the life of church members in whatever we do. Obedience to God, what does it mean? It means that you now live your life submitting to the rule of God, to the will of God. You recognize that God is the authority, is the king 
Now, whatever we do as church, whatever we do in the church, we must obey God. Whatever we do in our lives, in our homes, in the work, career, school, business, we should be guided by obedience. We must be showing obedience to God. Yes, before we might have failed. And yes, we fail to obey God. We might have wronged God. We wrong others. But then as church, as believers, we are encouraged to make things right. Regardless of what we did in the past. Regardless of failing in the past. We must encourage, encouraged by the Bible, encourage each other to rise up, to obey God. And that's what we need as church. That's why we need church. That's why I need you. We need each other. So that we encourage each other to obey God. Yes, sometimes situations are difficult. Life situations are difficult. Economic situation. Health situation. Many situations in life. Then you come and you say, but I, it's difficult. I can't obey God. I can't apply the word of God. I can't do what God is saying I must do. But that's where church comes in. That's how God works. Then to encourage each other through the examples of others, through the teaching of the word, through prayer, through encouraging each other, that brother, that sister, don't give up, don't give in, don't surrender to the world. And you make excuses for not obeying God. Let's overcome those excuses. That's what church must do. That's what we must do for each other. Overcome the excuses of disobedience or failing to apply the word of God. And that's what we then must do. Give each other wisdom from the word of God. Give each other strength through preaching, through rebuking, through prayer. And it is something indeed that we must do. And that is the outcome. That is what the church we must be proud of. And we boast about the church. People who believe God. People who repent. People who obey God. Now in conclusion, in our mission statement as Reformed Church Jobek, Reformed Church Ekurleni South, Reformed Church Jobek West, and the churches of classes Gauti, we say in our mission statement, we are called to be a congregation that strives for holiness and worships God and serves God as one body of Christ through proclaiming the gospel, doing deeds of love so as to encourage all people to believe and love and obey God. Do you see why we are a congregation? Do you see why we are fighting for holiness, worshipping God, proclaiming the word, doing acts of love? It's so that we encourage everyone to love, to obey God. So we can write good mission statements, but is it in our hearts? Is it what we hope for, what we cry about, what we rejoice about? Is it what we apply? Is it what we practice in church with each other, encouraging each other to love God, to obey God? It starts in the heart, it starts in the mind. We must have other believers in our hearts. And when we think of them, think of each other, we should be thinking of advancing holiness, unity of the body of Christ, working together that the gospel is strong in our hearts, but also spread in the world. Show love in the church and out in the world, but encourage that all of us, let's obey God. Let's worship God. Let's believe God. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Second Corinthians. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you know our hearts. And you know what our hearts should be. You are a doctor. You understand not just our bodies but you understand our soul, our spirit, what we need and what we should be. We thank you for your word which makes us to see 
even from the relationship of Paul and the church in Corinth, that indeed, even though there is tension, but love conquers. Love is strong. Oh God, help us to have love in all situations. Love for you, love for the people you love. Sometimes we look at the bad things, the failures, and we are discouraged. We are negative. But help us through this word to have hope, to have confidence in you and the work you are doing in us and in others. Help us, O oh God, to repent. As you have called us to start the journey with you, help us to repent every day. Help us to repent every time we realize sin. Help us to repent every time we hear your word talking to us, preaching, counseling, rebuking us. Help us to change. Give us humble hearts. Give us godly sorrow, which leads to repentance and leads to salvation. Oh God, help us that our repentance is not just feelings and words, but our repentance is indeed evident in action, in commitment, in consistency, in growth, in progress of loving you. Oh God, help us as church that indeed we work with you, that your salvation project, the outcome is that sinners repent. Let it also be our outcome. Help us to cry when sinners don't repent. Help us to rejoice with you when sinners repent. Oh God, give us the wisdom so that we can help each other to can apply your word, to can obey you in whatever situation you have called us in. Help us to be church. Our programs, our fellowship meetings should help us to apply your word today at work, at school, in our families. Help us, oh God. We need you. And as you have given us the church, as you have made us church, help us indeed to be that church. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, let us sing uh, the song from Nimbo Zabatendi, uh, 123, which says, Morena Wabutu. It is sung with the tune of number 36, Morena Udiba. Beloved, uh, indeed, let us spread the word. Uh, let us come to receiving blessing, but first let's sing this song from Nimbo Zabatendi, Ratanindi Lakuru. Let's sing verse 1, 2, and 3 as we receive God's blessing from Psalm 19.
Beloved, accept God's blessing from Psalm 90 and know that God is our refuge and is with us, not just in this earth life, but also even when we pass from this life, accept God's blessing. <clears throat> the everlasting God, for whom a thousand years pass like it's yesterday, yet he never changes with time. May he teach you to number your days so that you live with a heart of wisdom and an acknowledgement of God's existence and presence in your life. The gracious and merciful God, who has the power to sweep away like a flood and will disappear like a dream, may he show you steadfast love and compassion, so that you know the joy of sins forgiven and the assurance and gladness of his love even in the midst of affliction. The awesome and wonderful Lord, who works his glorious revelation to make you his servants, and children and covenant nation. May his glorious power favor you so that the works you do are established and through you the name of God is praised. Amen. Thank you, beloved, and continue to praise God. God continue to bless you. Let us finish by singing that song as we're singing 177. We'll sing verse 4 and 5. Rifa re, 